Let's start it. There's a lot of talk about sending humans to Mars, but no one talks about Venus. Why not? And could Venus actually be the better option for a human colony? We actually did watch a video about colonizing Mars and all of the logistical complexities that would come along with that. But some of you were saying that Venus could potentially be a better option and recommended this video. Personally, I don't know much about Venus, but I do like the channel. It's PBS FaceTime. Although this video is quite a few years old, so if you know of any updates to any of the information he gives, please feel free to add that. Going to Mars has been a fixture in our collective cultural consciousness for a very long time. It's inspired more sci-fi movies and stories than I can count, a ride at Disney World, and a Twitter following for the Mars rover that's almost two million strong. Meanwhile, Venus has inspired, what? Two Ray Bradbury stories, a plant that eats flies, and a razor? Basically, Venus has the worst public relations team in the solar system. And that hurts our sister planet, not just in culture and media, but in space policy. Presidents Bush and Obama and the Chinese government have all outlined goals for manned missions to Mars. The Dutch nonprofit group Mars One even held an international competition to find volunteers for a one-way mission to the Martian surface. But Venus, no manned mission love at all. Which is odd, since in most respects, Venus is actually an easier and less costly colonization target than Mars is. For starters, Venus is closer to Earth. That's why we sent probes to Venus long before we sent them to Mars, and why we sent more of them. Depending on the launch window, the round trip can be 30 to 50% shorter, which is a major factor for manned missions. Shorter trips means less weightlessness and radiation, less food and water to carry, and thus less fuel and lower cost. This would also be a huge advantage in moving the people and equipment necessary to actually colonize another world. Because bear in mind, there's no Craigslist in space. If we ever start a colony, we'll need to bring along almost everything. After that last video, I was looking into how long it would actually take to get to Mars. The answers varied depending on what source I was reading, but seven to nine months is what they were saying. One way. How long does it take to get to Venus? Also, seven to nine months, assuming you don't get what, knocked off course or die in Camino. And it's not just the shorter trip. The planet itself has some significant advantages over Mars. It's closer to the sun, which means about four times more available solar power than you have on Mars. It also has a thick atmosphere, unlike that wispy layer on Mars. That means better protection from space radiation and meteorites for our enterprising colonizers and their future cities. It also means more available carbon dioxide, from which, in principle, you might extract oxygen. But the real kicker is gravity. Venus has about 0.9 Earth Gs, pretty close, while Mars has less than 0.4. And one thing we do know is that prolonged low gravity is bad for humans. How bad? In Earth orbit, astronauts lose bone mass at about 10 times the rate of someone with advanced osteoporosis. Now, no one knows exactly how bad Martian gravity would be for humans, but it's definitely not going to be good. On Venus, that's far less of a concern. And remember, we're talking about long-term colonization, not just visits. Even if we had the technological means to add water to a planet's surface and oxygen to its air, changing a planet's surface gravity is currently not even within the realm of discussion. So terraforming seems silly if people couldn't live there more than a few months without their bones falling apart. A theoretical Venusian Valid. colony thus seems to have a lot going for it. So why then this tunnel vision for Mars? Surfacism. Okay, I just made that word up, but hear me out. Ever since the days of seafaring exploration, we've had an obsession with landing on the surface of things. If you don't plant a flag on something, it's almost like having gotten there doesn't count. So what's all this have to do with Venus, which actually has a solid surface? Well, it does, but humans can't land on it. See, there's a teensy problem with temperature. There's so much CO2 on Venus that the greenhouse effect makes the surface hotter than hell, over 450 degrees Celsius, well above the melting point of lead. But the bigger problem is the barometric pressure on the surface. It's over 90 Earth atmospheres. That means that landing on the Venusian surface would be like diving one kilometer underwater on Earth, far beyond the crush depth of most military submarines. In fact, most probes that NASA and the Soviets sent to the surface of Venus imploded in midair. We learned our lesson, and a few reinforced probes did manage to touch down and send images of the Venusian surface, but even those only lasted about two hours before, you know. The point is, I think surfacism is a real bias, and the fact that we can't live on the Venusian surface could help explain why Mars gets all the hype. But this is a bit random, but how many generations 
do you think it would take for humans to evolve to better suit these environments? I mean, if a baby's born on Mars, it's more likely to have genetic mutation because of the radiation. And then if that genetic mutation helps for survival, it might be inherited in other generations. But how many generations of Martians would it take to see that in significant number? Did that make sense? Because it sounded really rough. <laughs> okay. The year is 5024. And let's assume that there hasn't been a mass extinction event and we did end up colonizing Mars and there are at least, I don't know, 2,000 generations worth of humans there. Or are they? At what point are Martians no longer Homo sapiens? Surely there's a scientific answer to that. I don't know it. I hope one of you do. Maybe that's sensible. I mean, if the surface will kill us, there's no point in going there, right? Not so fast. See, around 50 kilometers or 30 miles above the Venusian surface, some interesting things happen. First, the temperature drops to only about 70 degrees Celsius. That's still super hot, but firefighting equipment on Earth can withstand proximity to forest fires with temperatures that reach over 2,000 degrees Celsius. The pressure at that altitude also drops to almost exactly one Earth atmosphere. That means humans would need heat-resistant clothing and oxygen masks, but not spacesuits to walk around in that environment. Granted, there's the minor nuisance of sulfuric acid floating around in the Venusian air, but that's potentially manageable. And at that altitude, the atmosphere is still dense enough for lots of stuff to float, like balloons filled with helium, or maybe filled even with just regular Earth air. Throw in the favorable gravity, and it starts to look like the upper atmosphere of Venus might be the closest thing in the solar system to an Earth-like environment. So, it might make sense to colonize Venus with cloud cities. I am not making this up. What in the NASA's Star Systems Wars? Analysis and Concept Directorate cool. has unveiled a conceptual blueprint for this scheme. They call it the High Altitude Venus Operational Concept, or HAVOC. Interesting branding choice, but still super awesome. We've linked the NASA videos in the description. You should check them out. Now, for the record, this is all still conceptual. We are very far from sending this guy to lead our Venusian cloud city, but NASA is taking the idea seriously. Right now, most of the chatter is still about using Venus as practice for colonies elsewhere, like Mars. So we haven't overcome surfacism just yet, but this might change. The gravity issue alone might make Venus the go-to option for long-term human habitation. And who knows? Centuries from now, if we learn how to sequester enough carbon out of its atmosphere, we might even be able to plant a flag or two. So what do you guys think? Is Venus a better colonization option than Mars? Put your two cents in the comments, or even better, tweet them. Hashtag Occupy Venus. If we start a grassroots movement, I'll let you know on the next episode of Space Time. So would you rather wear heat-resistant clothing and an oxygen mask or a spacesuit for the rest of your life? Like Earth is gone. It's done. You can't go back. <laughs> but Venus and Mars, they've each been colonized for the same amount of time. Which would you prefer to live on? I mean, I think after watching this video, I'm going to pick Venus. They each have their drawbacks. If you can think of any advantages that Mars has over Venus that he didn't mention, please write it. But I'll link the video for you. It's PBS Space Time. If you find any more videos that you think we should watch in the future, let me know the title. But in that last video, I think there were some really valid points in the comments. One was, as we have a lot of things to fix on Earth, at what point are we doomed to take our human problems over to another planet? They said that in a different way, but that's what I took out of it. Another was, who was going to pay for this? How likely are countries to work together and pull funding? Or would they create some type of union? or Things I think about now. If you have ideas, let us know. Also, just leave your thoughts on Venus. We'll go to the book recommendation. He mentioned the Ray Bradbury short stories I did in the last video. The thing is, it's from a collection. I just can't remember the name of that. I'll add a picture and link the book in the description. And of course, if I can find the free audiobook version of that short story collection, you'll find it in the show notes as well. And then for a music recommendation, I've got nothing on this subject. <laughs> nothing Venus related. If you think of one, tell me. I've been listening to A Forest by The Cure. I think that's one of their best from the 17 Seconds album. Because it's the cure, I guess, new wave, post-punk genres. 
And then another artist I've listened to lately, it's a group called Kurang Bin. May need a pronunciation check. The one I'm thinking of is called Como Te Quiero, but they fall under psychedelic rock, soul, R&B genres. Let me know if you like them. That's really all from me today. So thank you for watching with me, and I'll just catch you in the next video.